Sweet Shop by Mark Alexander, read by June Whitfield. To the girl, it seemed an age since the day her troubles had begun. Black Monday, she called it. But in fact, it was only the week before. On that afternoon, she sat in ing-lit class, fiddling with her hair ribbon, which she always did when she was bored, while Mr South rambled on about fairy tales of all things. There's a lot more to traditional fairy stories than you ever imagined when your teacher read Jack and the Beanstalk to you in The Infants, he said, his specs flashing as they always did when he tried to get the class interested in his subject. What people thought of as magic was really glimpses of the future. Do you believe in fairies, sir? asked Huey Cooper in a voice so respectful that some of the class could not help giggling. Oh, yes, he does, someone called out as they do in the panto. Oh, no, he don't, the class chorused, and this went on for a while. When it was quiet again, Mr South said... Think of what I was saying. In the story of Snow White, there was a magic mirror. What would that be today? The tally, sir, the class answered. And seven league boots? Everyone shouted something different, and in the end, Mr South agreed with those who said motor cars. And the magic carpet? Please, sir, said Huey Cooper. Isn't the magic carpet in the Arabian Nights, sir, not in fairy tales, sir? Mr South pretended not to hear and beamed when Betty Reynolds said, Concord, sir. What about Puss in Boots, sir? A boy asked from the back. That's a moggy in a chemist shop, said Huey, and there was a gale of laughter. Mr South was getting angry, but the buzzer saved the situation. It was home time and laughs were over for the day. Now think about fairy stories. He shouted over the banging of desk tops. Next lesson you will write me an essay on fairy tale things in modern life. In the playground, the girl met her brother. Being a year older than her, he was in another class and they walked home together. She told him about Mr South and his soppy fairy tales and he told her how someone had worked out a new video game in computer studies and before long they were in their street which ran down to the canal. Hey, there's Dad's bike against the fence, the boy said. Wonder why he's home. Even as he spoke, the girl felt scared. She just knew that something was wrong, and as soon as they went inside, she found out what it was. Their father was sitting at the kitchen table with a funny, not ha-ha look on his face and a mug of tea in front of him. Your dad's been made redundant, shouted Dora, their father's second wife. They could not bring themselves to call her mother. Twenty-five years I've been at Olroyd's, he said slowly, and even if I say so myself, I was their best joiner in the unmade furniture shop, and now I've been chucked out like an old boot. Seems there's no call for unmade furniture any more, so the old shop's being closed. They'll carry on making mass-produced rubbish, probably with robots, but they don't need craftsmen any more, and in my day, it took a five years' apprenticeship to learn the skills. Pity you hadn't learned something more useful, Dora said with her special sniff. Like what? her husband demanded. Like being in a clerk with the council, or a traffic warden. You don't hear of them being made redundant. But I'm a joiner. Whatever ability God gave me is in me hands. Dora sniffed again and dabbed her eyes with the tea towel. Don't take on, love, he said. I'll get something else. You've no chance, she replied angrily. Half the factories in this town are closed, so who do you think would want you at your age? You can't blame me for the recession. I did think I might find some sympathy in my own home. Oh, so it's sympathy you want. What about me? Did you think about me when you let them sack you? How am I going to manage? Answer me that, with those two not bringing in a penny and eating their heads off. It's about time they made their own way in the world. Dora, they're only school kids. They cost as much as adults to keep. With you on the unemployment, I don't know what will happen. Their father stood up and said in a shaky voice, Well, I'll be off down to the job centre. And he walked out. 
The children exchanged a look and went outside, but their father was already striding quickly down the long street. We'd better not go after him, the girl said. He'll want to be alone for a bit. Why the hell did he have to marry again? demanded her brother. I suppose he was lonely. He's got all the company he needs now. She could have laid off him on a day like this. Suddenly the girl laughed, a bitter, unsteady laugh. <laughs> now I know what old South was on about with his talk of fairy tales in the present day, she said. There are still such things as witches. <laughs> the boy looked bewildered, so she said, Oh, forget it, let's go down to the canal. When she was a little girl, the canal bank had been her favourite place. In those days, there had been working boats tied up by the factories which backed onto the canal. But now, a lot of them were empty. The water was stagnant and people threw rubbish into it. But it was still peaceful. As the two children strolled along the old towpath, they saw a silent angler with a fishing rod hoping to land a tiddler which had survived the pollution. As soon as I can, I'm going away, said the boy. Then he added, You can come with me if you like. Thanks. I'm sick of it all. Dora's nagging and the endless rows. We used to have such a good time. Seems like ages ago now. His sister took his hand, but could think of nothing to say. The canal ran through the town, but as it was hidden away behind buildings, most people had forgotten about it which made it a secret way for the children to wander, until they found they were in a part of the town which was strange to them. This must be the old town where the council was going to build those new blocks of flats, said the boy. Let's go and see what it's like. They went up a narrow passage between two warehouses and found themselves in a street where most of the houses had been knocked down. This had been done to make way for tower blocks, but the council had run out of money and the place looked like an old battlefield. Here and there a few houses, some lonely shops and a boarded-up church survived among the rubble. At the end of the street, a building stood by itself, and as the children drew nearer, they gave whistles of surprise. It was a sweet shop. Its paint was bright, its glass shone in the sunlight, and it had a sign on which... Gingerbread was painted in large golden letters. They went up to the window and there was another surprise. It was crammed with the biggest assortment of sweets they had ever seen. The display was not made up of Mars bars and such like, but old-fashioned lollies in big glass jars, sweets that their mother, their real mother, told them she used to get when she was a girl and which had to be weighed and put in little white paper bags. It can't do much business here, said the boy, but look at those jelly babies. Ah, <gasps> there's a jar of aniseed balls, gobstoppers, chocolate fish. If you're so interested, why not come inside, said a soft voice, and they saw a plump, white-haired old lady smiling at them from the door. The only odd thing about her was her spectacles, which magnified her eyes to twice their normal size. But the children soon got used to her appearance. Inside the shop, she gave them different sweets to try until the boy, feeling he should spend some money, bought a quarter of Pontefract cakes. Look, I have some gingerbread men, said the old lady. Do you know the story of the gingerbread man? My mum told me when I was small and I cried at the way the gingerbread man kept losing pieces of himself as he ran away the girl said. It seemed so sad. But not for those who were eating him, chuckled the old lady. She was pleased to have someone to talk to because, as she told them, she had lost most of her customers when the houses were demolished. But she loved her shop and did not want to leave it. They stayed chatting with her until it was twilight outside and they had forgotten what had happened at home. Come back to Gingerbread any time, she said as they left. My name is Hazel. The kiddies used to call me Aunt Hazel. You can, if you like. When they got back to the towpath, the girl found that the old lady had slipped a big bar of fruit and nut into her pocket. 
What a nice old dear, she said as she shared it with her brother. A shop reminds me of a picture I once saw in a storybook, he said. Didn't think there were any shops like that left. It's a find. Perhaps I will come back and see her. You're just out for free chocolate, he teased. Next morning, the two children did not wait to have breakfast, but hurried out. They were sick of the quarrelling that had flared up the night before, when Dora had accused them of always plotting against her because she had the bad luck to be their stepmother. It was something that had not occurred to her until their father had been made redundant. When they reached the corner, the boy said, I'm going to cut school today. The girl nodded. Let's go for a walk. Poor old dad. All those years at Holroyd's and Dora going on as though it's his fault. Without either of them discussing where they were going, they arrived at the cemetery. In front of the gravestone with their mother's name on it was a bunch of carnations. And they realised that it was not to the job centre that their father had gone the night before. Later, they found themselves wandering along the canal bank, a place where they were less likely to be reported for playing truant. I know, said the boy suddenly. Let's go and see Aunt Hazel. You might get given another bar of chocolate. They arrived at the shop called Gingerbread and had just enough money to buy a quarter of old-fashioned cough candy. You are not at school, said Aunt Hazel, staring at them with her magnified eyes. We gave ourselves a holiday, the girl said, and she laughed. Oh, I'm glad I was feeling lonely. Sometimes I don't open the shop in the mornings because no one comes. My only customers are kids from the council estate over there, and they come after school. But I'm glad I opened up today, because you both look as though you have troubles. We're all right, said the boy quickly. Good. But as you are on holiday, you can at least have a cup of tea with me. Having missed breakfast, they were happy to follow her into the living room, which was just as quaint as the shop, and full of old-fashioned furniture, which would have delighted their father. In front of an open fireplace dozed one of the biggest black cats they'd ever seen. And there was a parrot in a big cage who chattered, Open the door! Let me out! Aunt Hazel tapped the cage and said, Silly thing! You know Samkin would have your tail feathers the moment you were outside. But the parrot kept on saying, Let me out! Let me out! until she put a cloth over his cage and he thought it was night time. Why do you have bars at the window? the boy asked. Now that I have no neighbours, I'm nervous of burglars, Aunt Hazel replied. The bars make me feel safe. A burglar would need a blow torch to get in. But he might come through the door. Look. She put a key into the keyhole close to the doorway, and steel bars shot across it. I can operate the bars from the shop, too, in case anyone tries to get through to the house in the daytime. And at night I'm as safe as a bank, she said. It cost a lot to get them fitted, but at my age you don't want to be worried each time the house creaks. That's enough of me. Tell me about yourselves while you have your tea, she added as she went to a cupboard which was stocked with cakes and biscuits. She seemed so kind, rather like a nice granny, that the children found themselves telling her about their father being made redundant, how they did not get on with their stepmother, and how they would like to leave home. It was a great relief to talk about their problems to a sympathetic grown-up. She makes a change from Dora the boy whispered as they left her at the shop door, waving goodbye and telling them to visit her again. She likes you, the girl said. All the time we were having tea and eating those gingerbread men, she kept looking at you. Perhaps she wishes she'd been married and had a son. I'm going to run away to London, he said suddenly. The next few days were a nightmare for the girl. Her father looked ill and did not know what to do with himself, except to go to the job centre each morning. Her brother was moody and silent and stayed away from school, and she was terrified that he would leave home without telling her. One morning, his stepmother found out that he was missing classes, and there was an angry scene. "'You won't get any qualifications and you'll end up on the unemployment like your father,' she yelled." 
Haven't we got enough trouble without you adding to it? His father asked him. The boy ran out of the house, slamming the door so hard that Dora's collection of China draft horses rattled on the sideboard. His sister left soon afterwards, and it seemed that the furious voices coming from the house followed her. She wanted to find her brother quickly because she knew how his mind worked, and she guessed that when he stormed out he had made up his mind never to return. First she went to the cemetery, expecting that he would be paying a last visit before he hitchhiked away from the grimy old town. But she found no one there. Then she was certain where he'd gone, and in a few minutes she reached the canal. The only living things she saw were two swans, which for some reason made her think about Mr. South and his fairy tales. <laughs> Something to do with the swan princess, she supposed. How she wished she lived in a fairy tale land where all you had to worry about was dragons and ogres and wicked dwarfs. Much better than real problems. She was out of breath by the time she found herself in the demolished street where the sweet shop stood alone at the far end. Aunt Hazel, she called when she went inside, but there was no answer. It was the squawk of the parrot which made her open the door behind the counter and step into the living room with its pretty furniture and barred windows. To her horror, she saw her brother in front of the open cupboard and he was stealing. How could you? she gasped. And from such a nice old lady. I'm not taking much, he answered. Not money or anything. Just some biscuits and scones to keep me going till I reach London. It's still stealing, she said. You should have asked. I don't want anybody to talk me out of going, he answered in a sulky voice. And that goes for you too. She was about to give him an angry reply when there was a grating sound and the steel rod slid across the doorway behind her. Then Aunt Hazel appeared in the shop her huge eyes peering at them through the bars, as though they were animals in a zoo cage. Well, well, the chicks have returned to the gingerbread house, she chuckled. Welcome back, Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel.